we'll get underway. Um, welcome to the first of our lunchtime sessions. Um, apologies to Marcus, we've put him into a bit of an experimental situation here. The first uh, first sessions we've done at lunchtime, uh, but I'm sure the content's going to uh, to spread and um, we'll get uh, really good attendances for these in the futures. So um, I'll introduce Marcus a little bit um, later on, but just go through a couple of introductory slides um, before we get into the content of today's session. So just while we have your attention, we just bring um, your notice to a series of other uh, online sessions that SIPSI is running in the near future uh, about the survival of the fittest. These are running, as you see there, uh, 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, so that's 2 p.m. New Zealand time, on a series of Tuesdays, and a wide range of speakers there. Um, and um, yeah, we encourage you to connect and to join here and to earn yourselves 10 hours of uh, SIBSI CPD. Um, if you're not a member of SIBSI yet, uh, just bringing uh, again your attention to the potential of becoming an affiliate and uh, ANZ have got a special offer at the moment, 17 months subscription for the price of 12. Um, if you're interested in this, we'll be making this PowerPoint presentation available to you um, at, at the end of the session. Um, we can email that to every member that's uh, joined in via the Eventbrite link. Um, we've got an up and coming further seminar, again, Australian time in the evening about prefabrication. And again, um, encourage you to uh, connect into that if prefabrication is of particular interest to you. And here we've just got a short video from Connexus who are our sponsors. Um, I'll just run the video and we'll come back to it um, once that's finished. So, slight, slight technical problem there with the video, apologies for that. Um, so I'd like to move on to the technical content now and I'd like to introduce Marcus, who's an eco designer at Apricus Eco Engineering. Um, he's got extensive experience with sustainable heating technologies in the UK and also here in New Zealand. So I'd ask him, yeah, Mar invite Marcus to overtake the screen and that's great. And uh, over to you, Marcus. So just before we jump into it, um, if people have got questions that they'd like answered, uh, you should have a Q&A little tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Marcus says he's gonna multitask and, uh, and present and keep an eye on those and answer any that uh, might be answerable as we go through. Uh, but if not, we've got some time at the end of the session to, uh, to cover those questions. So, um, uh, just leave it over to you, Marcus. So, <clears throat> thanks, Roger. Can you see the screen all right? Yes, I can. Wonderful. All right, I'll see you, may everyone else can too. Um, so, yeah, as Roger said, that um, I've got the Q&A and the chat panel open. Um, if you can put it in the Q&A if possible, but if you forget, put it in the chat. That's fine. Um, and we'll have time at the end to go through stuff. Um, no worries. <clears throat> so this is one of three. Um, and so we look at wood pellet fuel today and we won't really dwell on boilers and, and everything else, but just the attributes of the fuel itself, because it's obviously a critical part of any 
system and particularly a biomass sustainable system to, to know what it is that we're burning and, and why and how we use it. And so just a quick thing about APCUS Eco Hot Water, we've been around for a number of years. Um, we started off just doing solar hot water, so that's why the, the name Apricus. And then in the last few years, we've diversified, so we're doing now Reclaim Energy CO2 hot water heat pumps and the Okafen and Easy Pearl ranges of pellet boilers. And the Okafen um, is the main one for commercial, Easy Pearl's more domestic style. So, what are wood pellets? And it, in New Zealand, particularly, but globally, it's 100% it's renewable fuel. And in New Zealand, it's really important to, to define this because it, it's essentially an indigenous fuel. And it's made from waste wood, sawdust, and post harvest forest residue. So it's entirely made from waste products. We're not going out as an industry and cutting down trees, which does happen in other countries and is causing a lot of controversy, and rightfully so, because it's not a particularly sustainable uh, way of operating, and especially when um, a lot of pellets are manufactured in order to generate electricity. So without recapture of the heat, it can be quite an inefficient process. So you might see quite a lot of chat on the internet, and there I know there's some movies out there where they're saying, oh, pellets bad. It's like, well, as with most things, there's, there's subtlety here. And so if you're making pellets from waste, that would otherwise go to landfill, or in terms of forest residues, they're going to decompose anaerobically. So essentially that just means that the carbon dioxide gets re-released at some point, maybe not immediately, but over the, the, the following months and years, back into the atmosphere um, as the, the act of the microorganisms that decompose. You, all we're doing by harvesting it and burning it as pellets is to uh, short circuit that process, but it's still keeping all the carbon in the current account. So because of that, in New Zealand, biomass under the Ministry for the Environment's emissions factors has the lowest carbon emissions of any fuel available in New Zealand at 0 0.003 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. And that is uh, from their emissions factors and if you look it up it's under the heading industrial wood um, and it's a uh, especially pellets um, but, but biomass in general direct replacement for fossil fuels for space heating there's really um, maybe capital restrictions and and reticence in design there's no reason not to use biomass and especially pellets as a plug-in replacement for a fossil fuel boiler. There's also a huge potential for the use of unused currently wood waste. So um, I, I'm, I'm involved in this a bit mainly through my wife who's a waste consultant and she tells me that there's a quarter of a million tons of wood waste that currently goes to municipal landfills. So that those are controlled ones. They're pretty certain about those numbers that that's that's pretty well documented because they have to make returns on what goes through the landfill. But there's another million or more tons that goes into commercial landfills and, and privately owned ones. So you know, there's a, essentially a ridiculously enormous amount of wood that currently goes to landfill that could have a better output. And th this wouldn't necessarily be made into pellets, but you can have displacement. So we've got a huge amount of sawdust burnt in timber mills at the moment in order to dry timber, which is fine. It's a sustainable way of, of drying timber in the process. But if you, these boilers are generally, you know, they, 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 they can take all sorts of rough and ready stuff. And so you can put in wood waste to dry timber, displacing untreated timber sawdust, which we know is a, a perfect feedstock then for pellets, and you've got this incredible um, improvement in our circular economy. And then we're not even, you know, I'm not even mentioning post-harvest residue that's currently being left at skids, um, but that will be many more hundreds of thousands of tonnes. So we just quickly look at chips and pellets, because those would be the two main biomass options in New Zealand. And wood chip has a huge amount of different range grades and we'll look at pellets a bit more but they're much more specific 
chips need to be close to a production site, otherwise it just becomes uneconomic and you end up with very high transport carbon emissions. Um, and wood chips are better load usually for larger um, applications where they have a de dedicated on-site energy services personnel. So um, a wood chip boiler will tend to need more maintenance at the, 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 the uh, arrival of fuel and the management of fuel because it's not a uniform product it will tend to need a bit more manpower, which is fine, especially when you're in a bigger boiler. But if you're just wanting the, the, um, the service of heat energy, it may not be the best choice, especially in a smaller applications. Um, and the energy density, moisture and fuel performance ranges quite a lot with chip, um, depending on the contract. So it's not a uniform product by any means. Um, and whereas pellets are, in order to be a wood pellet, they need to have very specific performance criteria um, and we'll go into that in a moment um, and so you end up with a, a, an easier handling of fuel um, more intervention more automation less intervention and my my take on it i mean of course pellets are also being used in very large sites so it's not to say that pellets can't be used right across the scale but when we get into the smaller sites if we're talking about a dedicated pellet boiler then it may well be that a, um, uh, a, they're more suited to the energy needs in, in those smaller sites. Um, so, actually, I guess, Trump and Perry. You just seem to be cutting out there for the moment, Marcus. In plus, and as would have us cutting out. Back, <coughs> back on track. The video, that would yep. help. Uh, possibly, but back on track now. Okay. Um, okay. So, flame. The... Oh, no, we're, we're losing you again. We can see the screen, just the voiceover for the moment. Ooh. Okay, yep. I've just dropped out. Yep. Um, Am I, I hear, um, back in again? You're back. I can hear you, Marcus. Yes. Um, definitely back yes, in. I'm not sure why that just disappeared. That screen, Thanks, screen's Nicholas. back up. <laughs> it seems to be mine. All right. Lovely. I'll, I'll probably leave my video off because um, that often helps to reduce bandwidth. Um, so... It is less energy dense than coal, but contrary to what maybe a lot of people think, is that it's only about 10% less energy dense than coal, um, which is really not a, not a biggie um, at all. Um, so, so technical attributes, we're looking at about five megawatt hours for every ton or, or 18 gigajoules. There is a small amount of variation between um, suppliers, but, but that's that's a pretty conservative um, middle number. And you look at a density factor of about six to 50 kilos a cubic meter, and we'll go into what that means in terms of area in, in a bit. 8% um, less or less difference between pellets and wood chip would be that the, the moisture content and, and the, the handleability, the, the, the ability to um, use it. Um, easily for, for mechanical transportation. I'm just going to check that there's no one else that's, that's using a whole load of bandwidth. Um, and then we've also got um, a very, very low ash content. So being one of pellets burnt, you end up with about five kilo Okay, all right, thanks. But it's just how it is, I'm afraid. Sorry, for hopefully um, I'm not cracking up too much. 
Um, Roger, if you could tell me if I start getting all shady, that'd be great. Yeah. We'll um, so just to go through the process, essentially sawdust. Now, interestingly, some some sawdust is is taken from others. So, for example, Nature's Flame and Aswood, they just make biofuels and, and Nature's Flame only make pellets, um, Aswood make a range. And so other organisations that are already into it and probably more that will come will have their own fibre sawdust. So, so the, the other two manufacturers are Niagara and Waipapa and they both are saw millers as their primary business and the manufacturing pellets essentially added value because they can use the sawdust to make a fuel, why wouldn't you? Um, and so screening, it's dried if required. Some like if, you, if you're using your own sawmill waste, you don't need to dry it because it's, um, it's, it's already off the dryer. Um, I'm wondering if there's, there's someone that's been trying to get in touch with me and I'm wondering if they're trying to get into the webinar. Hello, are you trying to get into the webinar? Yeah, are you trying to get into the webinar? No. All right, I'll speak to you later then. Sorry, I'm just in the webinar. Thanks. Sorry, I thought there was someone trying to get in, they couldn't. Um, so the products were refined, um, hammered if, if required. The way that pellets are made, they're pushed through at very high pressures, which also obviously raises temperature through a dye and that's what gives them the uniform size and shape and um also that you get a bit of a shiny coating on the outside when they're done at a really nice high pressure and that's naturally occurring lignin coming out of the wood and and essentially binding it all and and, and giving it giving it structure um and then they're, they're they're stored up ready to be dispatched so i said as would um We've got her in Nelson, and this um, map kind of illustrates the coverage that they um, that they have currently. And then Niagara down in Invercargill, they're mainly lower half of the South Island. Netcher's Flame in, in Topol, that they're, they're our biggest manufacturer by a very long way, probably 10 times the, the capacity of any of the others. Um, and they have national distribution. And then Waipapa up in Whangarei, who are relatively small at the moment and are just supplying to a couple of industrial sites, but are looking to expand. And there's some really interesting dynamics. You know, they're very close to Auckland. They deliver a lot of pine, uh, sorry, or finished timber products, lumber, to the Auckland market. I think, you know, uh, uh, half a dozen or more truck and trailers a day. And Auckland would be a place with an enormous amount of wood waste. So there's some really interesting circular economy dynamics here that I'm very keen to help explore. If there's anyone else out there that, that wants to collaborate on this type of work, that we can you know, make it an even more sustainable indigenous fuel um, by closing these loops. The other thing that I think is amazing, and, and I'm sure, Shouting this from the rooftop, so I'm surprised. Up to 15 years guaranteed supply contracts, and that also translates through to price. Now, I'd love to see another industry out there that's supplying fuel energy that will guarantee supply for 15 years. I really don't see it happening in the fossil fuel sector, um, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, and, and someone can correct me, but um, not from what I can understand. And all the manufacturers are increasing production because demand is increasing and having to handle these things bulk delivered in trucks by blow or auger or, or elevator trucks so there's no manual handling at all in any of the country so pricing because clearly this is available fuel it must be really expensive and therefore we're not using very much of it at the moment but it does vary on a number of factors and the price does range um, as with anything especially um based on volume but we're talking about the, 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 so checking out the main or all of the distributors the manufacturers the pricing that i'm getting from them is six to eight cents a kilowatt hour or these are the equivalents in gigajoules and tons because you buy it by the ton but you know if, an equivalence i think is more easily understood with kilowatt hours and as i said 15 year supply 15 year price contract is available up to 15 years and 
are again i'd like to see a fossil fuel um contract that would give 15 years of security of supply and price and to be at a number like that we're seeing in the market now for new commercial contracts for gas at around 11 cents a kilowatt hour um and electricity is going up i, I heard some pretty ridiculous numbers the other day for quite a big commercial buyer of electricity and they were what they were north of 25 cents a kilowatt hour in daytime um so i think there's a really interesting inflection point here where we've got a very important and and urgent carbon story to deliver um and to, to you know, promise to, to make and then we've also got a price point which is extremely competitive if not significantly cheaper so if we just look at compare it by heat source um, and just looking by technology, uh, I think, can I, can I have a little, uh, a little pointy thing? Um, hopefully you can see my mouse now. Maybe. Yeah, we can, we can see that. Okay. Um, so we've got pellet boilers, which burn pellets as our base case. We've got, I'm not going to use standard efficiency electricity, and I'm also not going to get into electro boilers because we, we're really looking at commercial applications here, not industrial. Um, but a heat pump, let's just give it a COP of three as, as an average. Um, and then gas boilers and diesel boilers. Um, I haven't bothered with coal because coal's clearly on the way out, um, especially in a commercial context. So if we look at just the reduction CO2 emissions, even versus a heat pump, even versus a highly renewable electricity grid in New Zealand, it's a 91% reduction in, in CO2 emissions which I think is quite remarkable, honestly, and, and it, it continues to surprise me, but I've double, triple, multiple checked the numbers, and it's because of the order of magnitude. If we just go back, pellets are 0 0.003 kilograms CO2. Gas is 0 0.2. Electricity is 0 0.1, more or less. And so even a heat pump, if you're at 0 0.1 and, you, and, and it's a third of that, it's 0 0.03 it's still an order of magnitude more than pellets. So in the New Zealand context, it's by far the most carbon, uh, or least carbon intensive, lowest carbon emissions. And then if we compare it to natural gas, 98% reduction in CO2, LPG 99, because we've got transport factors, and diesel 99. And this arm, it uses some leaves of domestic hot water down 60 degrees and um, so emissions is less than a thousand kilograms less than a ton so it's, 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 in fact it's only slightly more than half a ton of co2 and then a heat pump where 6.7 tons and then you know 40 45 54 there's a significant difference here and i think it's really important to emphasize this with your clients and with the designs you do these are all factors just based on the MFE um, emissions factors tables that you can get from their website. And then if we look at the running costs, I've got some numbers down here. I've said uh, conservatively eight cents a, a kilowatt hour for pellets, which are, is a bit more at the upper end of the spectrum of what we're seeing for commercial delivered pellets. Electricity at 17. I think that's fair. I think that's probably uh, maybe conservative. Natural gas, we are definitely seeing 11 cents a kilowatt hour. And my understanding is the new all of government natural gas procurement sits at about 11 cents a kilowatt hour once you've got all costs. LPG, 18 cents. And diesel at about 10 cents. That's based on a, a diesel price of about a dollar a litre, um, which is not particularly stable. Um, so heat pumps are slightly cheaper to run, but um, I would say that if you looked at the capital expenditure over time um, a heat pump's not going to last the 25 to 30 years that a pellet boiler will and also we're not factoring here with our co2 any of our embedded uh, co2 from fugitive emissions from refrigerants so again it's an issue to consider um, and then gas is more expensive lpg is more expensive diesel is more expensive um, as i say i think this is a really important inflection point and where are we going? You know, next, you know, in following years, what will be the price of fossil fuels and electricity? Do we think it's going to remain stable? Do we think it's going to go up a lot? 
I know where I feel it's going and watching the movement over the last, especially 12 months, it's been really informative. And our fossil fuel installations already becoming stranded assets because of that. So again, uh, just a cost comparison. So in this site, they were using about a megawatt a year, a bit under, and um, efficiency of plant makes quite a big difference here as well. So this is an existing gas boiler install operating at maybe 70%, maybe less. 85% um, would be a new um, pellet install. That's including everything, efficiency losses around pipe and heat exchanger and, and, the, and the like. Um, and so you've got some costs, maybe look at this later. But interestingly enough, so the size of the delivery can make quite a big difference here. And you've got a um, 12 ton to 28 ton uh, range. And it, it, you know, it's really significant difference in annual cost. And then once we sort of run that out over time and forecast it against um, 11 cents a kilowatt hour, the savings sort of add up quite quickly. Someone asked, does a model allow for labor costs? Um, as there is all fully automated delivery of pellets with no manual handling, then I wouldn't see any difference in labor costs. Um, the boilers, uh, to be fair, a boiler will have a, a higher maintenance cost than a heat pump. So there probably needs to be factored for that, but the gas boiler or diesel boiler and definitely a coal boiler would have very similar, if not more, labor costs in terms of maintenance than a pellet boiler, certainly the aquifer ones. I hope that answers your question, Nicholas. Um, and, you know, the carbon, it just speaks for itself and we're at a four year payback. So um, there is capital to expend, but um, we need to expand capital in order to start improving the life that we have on this planet. So other factors that impact on the pellet, pellet price, um, we've got four manufacturers. So obviously they compete and being debt based in different places in the country, as I've demonstrated, you may well get a better price to be closer to um, the, your site. Um, annual tonnage has a big impact. So, um, Again, the different suppliers have different ways of looking at it. And so it's always good to, you know, we've got a competitive market. We, we can use it and say, okay, what, what, what will you give us? And then go to another supplier and ask the same questions. But usually the price breaks are, are usually around up to 50 tons, up to 100 and up to 500 tons. And after that, you're probably not in a commercial site. You're in an industrial one because you're at two and a half thousand megawatts, so two and a half gigawatt hours. That's a, that's a lot of fuel. Um, and, but, you know, interestingly, if you've got multiple sites, there's no reason that you can't get this price break between different sites from the same fuel manufacturer. So we're doing that, for example, with Somerset Retirement Villages. So they're going to be rolling out more pellet boilers over time, and they'll just keep on climbing up the grades because one site might use 100 tonnes, but five sites might use 500 tonnes, and there's significant savings available. Freight cost is going to be distance from the fuel, not necessarily the manufacturer, but their bulk store. Hopefully you guys can still see my mouse. Um, yes, we can. Great. So Nature's Flamer in Tolpool, but they also have a bulk store in Christchurch. And I think at some point they will have Wellington and Auckland as, as demand increases. Um, Aswood or Nelson, they have bulk stores in Christchurch and Dunedin, as well as Nelson. So we've got quite a nice split through the country and especially, you know, Tallpool being so centrally located, we've got really good delivery linkages, you know, in whatever direction for the North Island and the South, longer Island, but we've got a good, good split. And how much a pipe site can receive makes an, again, another impact on price because essentially you're reducing the proportional cost of freight per ton by having a larger store and how it's delivered can, can have some variation as well. Generally, in a commercial site, we'll use a blower truck if possible. Um, it gives them the most flexibility on um, store design. Um, and so 12, tron, 12 tons or so, 12, I think as would have got a 15 ton, but around that uh, for a truck and, and 28, 30 tons for a truck and trailer. Um, and again, no manual handling, just blown in. 
Um, and the other, the other, sorry, the other thing about blower trucks is that there's a pretty big fleet of blower trucks already out there that blow things like chicken feed and grain and I don't know what else, agricultural products. So there's not going to be a huge um, lag period in terms of increasing supply. If you've got a customer somewhere where blower trucks aren't currently delivering pellets, it really shouldn't be an issue because bulk pellets get delivered to a place and then that uh, local contractor will then do the blowing. And that's what we found with places like um, Central Otago um, and others. So how do we store it? So there's a couple of coal bunkers. So um, one's a school on the left here and the other one's a hospital. And so um, the school was delivered by dump truck. You see that quite a lot out there. Um, and so now that's been walled off. And you can see up here, there's a couple of fittings that are capped off and the blower truck just turns up, connects a pipe onto this and then blasts them into the, the, the bunker. So you can see, oops, you can see the bunker um, somehow, can I see it? Gets filled up, the bunker goes down quite a long way. So in the past it would have been tipped in and, and this is now designed so it just gets blown in. Um, and in bigger sites, you have quite a bit of this um, of a, a delivery grate so the truck dries in and then dumps and in the same way that they dump pop coal they dump pellets um, the only thing to bear in mind is that we just need to probably do a little bit of water, waterproofing um, to make sure that it's entirely weatherproofed can i go to the next page all right so the other way is if we create um, a, a new room or, or modify an existing one so here you can see that the two uh, blower uh, points now in New Zealand we probably just have one um, it, with such a narrow store but with uh, th that one I showed you at Edgecombe College we, we had two so they're spaced out so you can you know more easily fill evenly the entire space um, and just to remind you a cubic meter of pellets is about 650 kilos um, and so you can then work up from there you know how much space do you have one thing to bear in mind is that when you build up um, in a, in a space like this, we have to have a sloping floor. And so you do lose quite a bit of area, but you can have multiple boilers, especially the way that we do it with Aquafen. You have multiple boilers, multiple augers, and you lose a lot less space. So if I just show you, this is the inside of that room I showed you in Edgecombe College. And so we've got four augers. And so we don't end up losing as much space as you would here because we've got a much flatter plane and then just there's a bit of slope on, on either edge that, that goes up higher. And um, this is the other end of it. So just back through the wall. So auger, 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 and then vacuum feed to the boilers. So just as a rule of thumb, you've got some empty space here and you might lose a, up, to a th up to a third if, if you're just having a single auger. But as you can see, taller and narrower is much better than wider and, and, and shorter to, to get optimum use of the space. And, and you always have to preserve an airspace at the top um, to, 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 to blow into and, and a little bit of off-gassing as well. Um, another way of storing it, and this is something that Orkafen have, have really done a lot of work pioneering, is a flexible fuel storage system. So the benefit is that there's no construction work for sloping floors or bulkhead walls. You've just got a, a flat concrete base and then the, the frame takes the, the weight um, and you do need though a blower truck delivery. So essentially uh, a truck plugs in, this pipe can extend quite a long way and I'll show you how that works in a commercial building context in a minute. Um, and it inflates the bag, literally, when, when, it, when the, the truck first starts, it just blows air, blows up the bag like a big balloon. And then um, it blasts the pellets into it. Um, the Aquafen ones have these big spring loads on the side. So it means that as it fills up, it, it, it can take up the maximum room, but then you still get the sloping side as it starts to empty. So you get maximum use. So you leave only a very small amount of pellets at the very bottom that can't be used. That if you had it entirely square, you'd end up with this big chunk of, of pellets or, or space here that doesn't get used. Whereas with the, the spring loading, it, it, it slopes the floor and, and essentially pushes the pellets back into the center to the auger. So pretty bloody smart. 
Um, and these go up to eight ton would be our biggest one of, of this style. Um, and I've just given you an indication of a few. Um, so, you know, this, the, one of the smaller ones would be about 2.6 square meter footprint. So you're really not a particularly big space, and, and, but it's only gonna hold three tons. But even eight tons, you know, we're only needing 6.6 .6 square meters, 6.7 square meters of, 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 of area within a building. And you can have a variety of different arrangements to, to, to suit different. These are just four examples. I think there's about 12. Um, so it's a really not particularly space hungry and it can be uh, somewhere quite a long way away from your other uh, services. So let's just have a look at that. This is a example of a pellet store and delivery in eight story residential care facility that's gonna be built in Auckland. That, that's not actually it, it's to be built, but just to give you an illustration. So if we just zoom in on the design, you've got two stories of, of, of basement and in the sub-basement level one, we've got our two eight ton pellet stores. So we've got 16 tons. Um, and so if I just work that out quickly, 16 times 5.1. So we've got 81 and a half megawatt hours of stored fuel energy when those are, uh, are full. So, you know, it's a significant amount of, of energy. You don't need, we're talking about maybe six weekly to two monthly deliveries, depending on time of year. And you've got an awful lot of resilience there as well, because, um, you know, in, in these unusual times that we live in, the, the, the more that you can have just on site, the better, really. Um, they're in the sub-basement, so you've got direct loading, um, ground bearing, and so you've got 16 tonnes spread over about, um, how many square meters it was um, and, and there's no additional strengthening there from what I understand from the, the structural engineers um, and then a story up and about 20 meters away are the pellet boilers and then another story up is where the delivery truck so you, you can imagine over here we've got a service uh, ramp and there's some bins and various other bits and bobs that you have at the back of a building and there's simply uh, a socket on the wall one for each of these fuel stores and then a whole load of 100 mil metal pipe that comes down plugs in there obviously that's all fixed in the wall and then there's one for the other one and so truck turns up pulls up plugs into first fitting fills up the bulk bag, gets told, okay, bag's now full, there'll be a little indicator light up here, and then plugs into the second bag, fills up second bag, up bag's full, done the job. And so there's no disturbance to the building. It's gonna be very similar noise levels to a rubbish truck turning up and, and lifting up you know, bins, and um, it'll be done in you know, 20 minutes or so, once every six weeks. So I would suggest significantly less disruption than rubbish truck. So in this case, it's 20 meters from there to there and another 20 meters from there to there. So you can see there's quite a lot of flexibility. This is in the main plant room. So you've already got all your um, services and we haven't had to disturb the rest of the building design. The flue just goes straight up um, onto the sixth story um, and out through the roof. Uh, all the building services connected here and then our pellets are tucked away in a little bit of unused or, or not unused maybe, but but low value, low premium real estate at the very bottom corner of the building. So if we just look at pellets in terms of material safety and fire safety, they're not hazardous, they're not classified as DG, there's no HASCHEM code allocated, there's no emergency procedure guide or GEED. Um, spillage is just requires sweeping and vacuuming. You know, it's really, it's not a big deal if it falls on the floor. You just got to get, get it, get it off the floor. Um, they auto ignite at 200 degrees. So at that point, quite a lot of the structure of the building starting to go up. So it, it's not going to be a source of ignition. It's not going to be a source of fire. If you, if you have a big bag of pellets like the ones we just saw and you chuck a match into it, the match is going to go out. If you chuck a lit piece of paper into it or even probably a lit piece of wood into it, eventually you'll get a little bit of smoldering of the pellets um, if it remains, you know, whatever you've put in burns for long enough to make that happen. But the pellets are very dense. They need forced air to combust properly. And so sure, they may smolder a little bit, 
but you know you really got to work hard and, and you need to have them at 200 degrees before they'll start to ignite and, and even at that point there's no explosion there's no um you know it, it, they're gonna they're gonna combust slowly and, and smolder away basically and the fires can be fought with all sorts of different um chemicals and substances um, and the thermal products are just carbon monoxide and dioxide, so there's nothing particularly worrying when they do catch on fire. Um, and certainly for that retirement village, so for this, these pellet hoppers are in their own fire walled uh, room, but that's just a case of putting a wall in front of them. And, and you know, they've already got two walls, um, three walls, sorry, on either side because they're tucked into a, a, a bit of a corner bulkhead. Um, and that's it. Then we've got a metal pipe going up here to delivery. That's going to be empty whenever there aren't the deliveries anyway. And then we've got a, a plastic pipe to the boilers over here. And they've got um, fire sleeves any time they break through a firewall if, if they or fire cell if they need to. And so that's a wax filling. And, and once it gets hot, it closes and you can't get um, uh, transmission between different fire cells. And I think that is me so yeah that is me on pellets so we'll export boilers and applications in future webinars if you'd like to attend but if you've got any questions really happy to take them and any discussion there's a couple down in the chat marcus okay. i'll open the chat sorry i wasn't looking at the chat what is the decomposition period uh, um jerry and i'm assuming you mean uh for stored pellets um I don't know, honestly speaking, but if they're kept dry, um, as in, so, so ambient moisture in the air is not a problem uh, at all, but you wouldn't want water to get into them or on them because that will be essentially immediate failure. Um, but dry, they're stored for years in some circumstances. So I doubt there'd be any issue at all in a commercial um requirement ah oh, yes thought okay um let me just bring this over here um and storage room requiring specific ventilation to exhaust potential co and co2 it depends on scale so in a commercial setting if we're just talking about a small amount of pellets you know relatively small here so you know, five ten twenty tons then no, the, if, if, if you had a room, so if, if you use, let me just go back for a sec. So the two different ways of storing pellets are in a, uh, a store like this, when you would have signage on the outside of it and you'd have some form of ventilation to to, to, to remove the carbon monoxide that will slowly build up as a decomposition product. And you'd want to have safety um, procedures in place just as you would for any uh, confined space. So second person, um, you know, not, not going to it in certain conditions. Um, and you may, depending on the scale of it, you know, once we start getting over 20, 25 tons, you may want to have an oxygen um, monitor on there or CO monitor. Um, so you can assess the, the level of risk. But for the bagged ones, this is essentially a breathable bag. And so as the pellets very slowly decompose, any CO, any carbon monoxide will be vented into this room in, in, in tiny concentrations that would be less than, than anything else, um, you know, that is also venting off. And so there's no, no hazard associated with that because just normal air changes associated with it just being a, a building with appropriate ventilation for, for humans to breathe um, would more than compensate for, for any CO developed. It's only really in a, in a pellet store where the air changes are restricted. Uh, storage seems to present key risk when storage isn't suitable. It directly affects pumps of the boiler. Uh, so this is from David Summers. Um, should we, will we make David, um, can we get David to talk? Is that, can we do that? Um, Roger? Yes, yes I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. David Summers allowed to talk. David. 
if you'd like to unmute your microphone. Oh, I think I've, have I done the right one? Am I unmuted? Yeah, you are unmuted, David. We can hear you now. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for that. W welcome. Thank you. It's been really good. David, guys. rather than me, um, like, m mutilating your comments, could you just make them to, to the group, please? And then we can all... Yes, uh, Marcus, of course. So, um, from experience, um, above ground storage is normally challenged by, you know, lead designers. So we're talking our architect friends and um, where from experience has been pushed to below ground solution. Um, I've experienced issues with moisture uh, and in, in some cases heat buildup also when um, moisture didn't occur. There was also um, a heat buildup where it was triggering fire detection systems. So was so this with pellets or was this with chip? Um, both. Okay. Yeah. Um, however, at that stage, there wasn't a fuel bag uh, offer or system. So this was two separate projects I was involved with. Um, and there was two separate occurrences. And then my next, I'll put up my next question I was going to add. So this leads into that. So the group can read it too. So, and then from direct experience, end users. In, in both of those occurrences where um, there seemed to be a big drive around seeking out fuel types. And this was mainly back to cost. So this could be different again, as these technologies progress and there's more of them around. But typically again, you can imagine cost dependent was back to quality of fuel. And again, that just led into performance of the, the heat pack or the boiler. But then again, if you're saying that is that 15 year competitive price um, lock in, then it, that should eliminate, you know, your energy manager on client side going out and really trying to hunt down uh, a most competitive price. Yeah. Because that, that competitive price is always reflected of the, the quality of the fuel, which, which is which is completely commercial sense. Right. But. Again, there needs to be that understanding that when the design team pull off, um, that type of fuel grade needs to be kind of the commitment there is to, to use that type of fuel grade and um, not just going off piece. It's kind of like, you know, dare I say, running a, a very old fashioned car now, you know, whether you yeah. use certain types of fuel at the pump. Yeah. Um, you the, know, if you, you so I was going to say a relatively easy way of resolving that as a designer would be to specify the fuel type in the operating and maintenance in you know, manual provided. And if it's a certified fuel, so like as would nature's flame, both DIN plus and EN plus respectively, then that will guarantee to meet our requirements as a boiler distributor and Orkfens as a manufacturer and, and, and others, you know, ETA and whoever else is, is out there in the market. Um, if it if it meets though the, the you know there's an ISO standard and there's a couple of different certifications which essentially just go back to the same quality control measures and continuous testing. The, the critical point there is continuous testing, so it's batch testing rather than just oh yeah we've got the standard and thanks a lot we paid our money and we walk away. They actually have to have every batch tested. Yeah, um, and then if 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 that's written into your um, O and M or into your into your spec um then then that's fine with us and, and, and with other as boiler suppliers yeah i mean those those um requirements were actually backed off by the supplier so yes they were definitely included and, and, it, and it was an end user choice um but that kind of limited the focus back on the designer but still <laughs> you can imagine there were site meets and um various uh exchanges um, but yeah. yeah, just just sharing an experience, really. That yeah, no, good to know. Things, I think things it, to consider, more, you know? Yeah, I think the quality is more impacted by, uh, sorry, the, the yeah, the, the quality yeah. range is much greater and, and much more variable, much harder to define with pellet uh, with chips mm. than it is with pellets. Um, so, because yeah, essentially, if a pellet's going to stay stable and and you visually remain a pellet and not just be a big pile of sawdust 
which is which is what it starts off as. Yeah. You know, yep. If it goes back to being a big pile of sawdust, you know you've got some very serious quality management issues. Um, and yeah, it, it, whereas chip, it's um, yeah, it's, it's a much more moving target. Yep. Thanks for that, Marcus. It's really good. Awesome. Thanks, David. Um, Rick, was, yeah. Rick Deaton asked about Ockfen uh, Sterling engine. Yeah, that they're doing well, Rick. Um, so they're on the smaller scale uh, domestic, you could say, um, Ockfen boilers, and they, it's called Energy 365, I think they call it. And so you take off a certain fraction of the heat and um, it runs a Stirling engine and, and generates power. So um, it's definitely something that we could bring into the country if, if there's an interest. Um, they're relatively small boilers, so you have relatively small heat loads. Um, so it suit a, a well insulated European style, shall we say, house um, that uh, then you know, had a degree of autonomy through solar and the the, the um, three six five. I think one from a New Zealand context, one kind of qualifier is that our heating season. I, I see you're from Wanaka, so all respects your heating season can be longer than a lot of other people experience but our heating season can be quite short and so um just trying to get that balance right it's something i've thought of though if you've got a domestic hot water load that's constant or a you know say a spa pool or something like that where you really want to use heat frequently and consistently and therefore the use of fuel and the boiler is justified including the generator of electricity um but yeah, they, they, they work well. So um, if you want to, you know, if we can help you, if that's a specific one. Um, or let's have a chat then, Rick, you're doing hot tubs. So I don't know if I've spoken to somebody else about hot tubs and pellet boilers before. They wanted a portable solution. And I said, well, I, <laughs> the hot tub might be portable, but the pellet boiler is going to be a bit harder. Um, awesome. Well, let's, let's have a chat, Rick. Um, anything else that I can cover? With anyone else, Roger? Have you got any other? You, you're a no. I, I think um, I think you've you've covered that really nicely, and you've set up um, the the taster for the following on session. So just to remind participants that uh, Marcus will be back same time, same place next week to talk about the uh, the boilers and the equipment. So you've you've kept everybody enthralled for the whole session. Um, oh, we haven't lost anyone. Great. <laughs> Well no, done, no. thanks. <laughs> no, they've hung on really well. So that's uh, that's a credit to your delivery in the the subject matter. Um, and I think uh, clearly there are people here who are experienced with this, but I think it's kind of possibly a new fuel to possibly quite a few New Zealand engineers. So um, that's a fantastic subject, and look forward to hearing more next week. So yeah. if, if if there are any any more, uh, if there are no more questions, we will. We will close it there and um, yeah, look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot, Roger. Thank you. That's great.